All right, well, I guess we'll do another little Atlas vlog here just because I've ended up in casts yesterday and I shook these castings out yesterday afternoon after they'd cooled and I've been cutting stuff apart, laying stuff out, figuring out what I'm doing today because I'm working on the foundry again today. I've got a couple of a couple of little foundry pro projects that I want to get rammed up and uh, we're going to do some more development of castings and patterns here. Um, today I'm going to try and get a uh, at least one oil pan for the Atlas Shaper poured and probably at least one um, door for the shaper to go on there so and I've done both of those before so we're gonna get them up I don't know that I've got the uh, got the shaper doors listed on the website yet I, or on this website I need to go back and and see if I do and if I don't get them loaded once I get one cast and painted up uh, the stuff I cast up last week why or yeah, I think it was Thursday or Friday. Anyway, I've got one shaper guard that's being painted now. You know, it's in the, it's got the first couple of coats of paint on it. I got to finish it up today because it's going to ship tomorrow. And I ended up and did cast yesterday, so I've got some castings done. Um, still prototyping on this. This was the six-inch follower rest, and you know, this is this is the first one I've cast of these in several years. I did a couple of these early on, but it never followed up with them you know just wasn't interested in enough um rammed one up yesterday got fallout you know where we filled here and here and both of the cutouts got some shrinkage in it uh the way it was gated and uh, i see some changes that i'm going to make to it which i knew i think i am going to go ahead develop these a little bit further but the only way that i can even sell a blank casting for this and have it be worth my while to you guys is if I've got them mounted on a match plate and can cast up multiples at a time. So that's kind of product development there. That'll that'll happen here as I go along. I'm probably going to cast up another one of those with a couple of changes today. Uh, I've got another match plate vibrator blank cast. I think I've got two or three of these sitting. I may get around and start machining on these today if I have time. Uh, anytime I try and cast, if I've got, think I'm going to have enough aluminum and have room for another flask, why I will normally ram up one of these. It's quick and easy to do, you know, off the match plate. It doesn't take me any time and, and they're pretty foolproof as long as I've got a, a uh, sprue in there that actually meets where it's supposed to go why the match plate does the rest so these are pretty much foolproof so i always try and throw these in i'm always using match plate vibrators so the shaper guard that i passed up cast up yesterday this is on all i've done is cut off the the uh, sprues and riders risers and feeders this is pretty much the way they come out and uh, this one i will probably get machined out and finished out today but all in all you know, I'm very happy with these. A little bit of touch up on the outer edges. And, um, you know, we're kind of kind of getting this dialed in. Now, one of the things that is worth noting on these, when you see these listed on Flea Bay, why they will always show you pictures of the inside that shows the, um, shows the part number. And they've all, normally they will try, even though it's usually covered with paint, they will try and show this little casting chartreuse in here that uh, are cartoons. Um, and I think that's a foundry mark. I think the individual foundries, wherever they were cast, they had their own little foundry mark in there and they put them in. So on the listings, they will always show you those to show that they're a, an original casting. I've never cast one of these that I can ever remember. My patterns have always had the part number in them. Now you can tell the difference between a factory original part number and my part number on this particular casting. Um, and there's usually some indication of the little foundry mark on there. Um, mine are getting pretty well washed out and I may redo something on there. So anyway, just be aware, just because they've got a, a part number, original Atlas part number in there, doesn't mean it's an original part. Because like I say, mine have all had that They've always had a part number in them. That's been there forever and ever and ever. So I will finish that up. A um, couple of things I was going to show you, a couple of things that I have been working on. I said Saturday when I was looking at listings, we were looking at the larger Atlas Shaper Guard, and they were always cast iron. And I said that was kind of a tough casting to do. Uh, the reason it is, it's not necessarily a tough casting, but for a small shop or a small foundry and a little one-man operation like I am, these are a hard casting to cast. Uh, several reasons. 
and you run into the same issues with the smaller guard, but not to the extent that you do with these. This is just a big casting um, for the small shop. Now, when these were originally being produced in cast iron in a big foundry where they were doing all kinds of parts, their metal was always hot enough. They had the system down there. You know, their mold makers knew what they were doing and they could ram these up quick and easy. When you try and do these in a... Uh, in a little shop like mine, you've got an awful big flast here. Now I do have a, I've got an odd side made up for this so that I can ram them up. You know, it's not even this way. You've got to account for your hinges that are cast in and all of those make it difficult. You add that to the fact that you put that, you have to put that in a flask that once you get it rammed full of sand, you've got about 130, 140 pounds of sand in there. Why it's a, it's a tough one to handle for the little guy like, for a little guy like me, it's hard to handle those great big castings. So I will probably rework that. As I said, I haven't done any of those for years and years, but um, I may reintroduce those in aluminum. You know, they're tough to come by and there again, they think they're worth big bucks. So the only other thing I've got is I thought I'd show you a pattern that I've been working on and I've been working on this for a while. Um, I'm not gonna show you all the intricacies of it, but I'll give you the general gist. This is for the Atlas Mill. And let me, well, let me bring this in a little bit closer and bring you down here. What this is, is the, the coolant tank that was offered for the Atlas milling machine. And this was a manual coolant tank. And if you look at the outer profile, now this is set up on a match plate. And this is laid out, and I may have overcomplicated this, but um, I've got a couple of good castings out of this, but I'm still modifying it. This is a coolant tank that mounted up on the overarm or next to the overarm. And uh, this is my pattern. Like I say, this is one of the match plates. And the way this is set up is I've got, I've actually got three, three sections of flask and I've got three match plates in this particular one. Um, but anyway, this is what the, the general profile of it is, just like that. You now we've got mounting supports coming out this way that it mounts up on the overarm. And that's what it is. Um, but just the way it goes together, we've got sprues, risers, and everything directly set into that. And um, it all goes together. I've got a core box made up for it with a core. And um, I'm still, still tuning that a little bit. I don't have my sprue sizes quite right yet. I don't have it fed quite right yet. Um, and I'm going to have to open it up so that I can get a little more metal into it is what it amounts to. My sprue needs to be a little bit, a little bit larger. Um, and I'll, I'll link this to my foundry videos too. We'll put it in that playlist because it's actually probably more relevant there than it is to Atlas stuff. Um, what I found on everybody's foundry and their casting setup and their patterns are going to be a little bit different. You're going to have to find what works for you. I've always used a little bit bigger sprue and riser maybe than I needed to on some stuff. And when you watch some of the other YouTubers like Old Foundry Man, he tends to use these little bitty sprues, taper sprues, and says that's all you need to have. And I think in an ideal world, that's true. And when I look at a lot of his castings and his techniques and stuff, he works out of primarily smaller flasks. Most of his castings are fairly small. You know, he does a little bit of bigger stuff, but primarily he does smaller castings and everything. When you get into the bigger castings like this Atlas Shaper Guard, even the small Shaper Guard like this right here, and, and I've gone to using these smaller tapered sprues. And on some things, they work exceptionally well. And I think it's there, there's some valid reasons to using that. When I get into patterns like this, I found that I had quite a bit more trouble getting a good uh, pattern out of these or a good casting out of those using the small um, sprues. The reason being is you just can't flow metal fast enough and keep it hot enough. These are a relatively thin casting and if you try and use them in the size of flask that I've been casting them in, and I like a smaller flask, the smallest flask I can get by with, you know, they're easier to handle, you use less sand, you can ram up more molds with the sand you've got available at a time for a casting session. So I try and use the smaller cast or the smallest flask that I can. And this still takes a relatively large flask for the home, home foundry. Um, to be able to get enough feeders on this to where it will consistently feed and, and it'll, it'll always fill 
fairly well. But if you're not feeding metal fast enough to it or enough volume, you'll get short shots down through where they've gone through, you know, because you've got to you've got to feed metal no matter where you feed it from and no matter where you put your risers. You've got to feed metal in fast enough and keep it hot enough to where it's going to fill on this side here, here and here. So I found I don't know if you saw that or not. So you've got to keep enough metal flowing to where it's going to feed this side here, here and here all at the same time without it cooling off too fast and, and shorting. So you've got to run enough metal through that sprue down in there and I don't feel that smaller sprue will do it. So I've gone back to a larger sprue and changed some of the ways I've vented these um, because I can get a good casting out of it using the smaller sprue but you end up and have to vent the vent the pattern quite a bit. If I run a larger sprue and riser down through it both going in and going out I found I get a better casting and I don't get the little marks in the in the top where I have put um, vent holes in there so it just depends on what you're casting how you're casting what your setup is and what you're doing so anyway that's what's going on in the shop hopefully you find this a little bit interesting if you do like these videos and uh, haven't i'd appreciate it if you'd hit that subscribe button if you hit the bell notification you'll know when i put out a new video you'll know when i put out a new video comments or suggestions leave them in the comment section for me below and as always thanks for taking the time to watch